Welcome back to Monroe Live. So today we have the BYD Shark. Now, there are not very many of these in the US to review. So we're very happy to be able to get this one for a short period of time before this thing is coming to pieces. So uh, we won't have a lot of videos before it comes apart, but hopefully we will have more as we can dig into some of the different components. Now, when this was up on the hoist in the air, it actually looks smaller than it is on the ground. On the ground, this actually looks to be a respectable sized truck. This is a hybrid, so both gas and electric vehicle. So when you go back to the different trucks that we have reviewed or we have torn down, we tore apart the F-150 Lightning. Now the F-150 Lightning very much is a traditional truck that is full electric. So the thing that I like about that type of vehicle is it's comfortable to people that are expecting a traditional truck. You can get in that vehicle and move into a regular gas truck. The truck itself feels the same, but of course it is different to drive. Then we had the Rivian. Now the Rivian was a new vehicle and it was mostly a luxury vehicle that happened to be a truck. Very, very stylized, a lot of money put into the interior, a lot of money put into the different design features of that vehicle. Then we went to the Maverick. Now the Maverick is a hybrid. So similar to what we have here. The Maverick was a very cost conscious vehicle for the North American market. So we're looking at a vehicle in the $30,000 range that is a truck, is a hybrid. I think it has kind of a best of both worlds approach, although sometimes you wanna say, do one very, very good, you don't have to be all things. So looking at this BYD, now I am not entirely sure what a North American sales price would be. I've seen anywhere between $30,000 and $60,000 for the vehicle cost. So if I put my brain in the mindset of a $30,000 vehicle, then I'm thinking about the Maverick. So I'm looking at styling and I'm looking at features that are comparable to that. Once I go to that $60,000, now I'm looking more into the F-150. So if I was comparing to that $30,000 price range of the Maverick, the interior styling and possibly quality of materials would blow away the Maverick. Um, that is impressive if this is at that price. If this is $60,000, then this would be more expected. Looking at the seats, perforated vinyl, several different types of breakup, different types of seams, center French seam, a lot of decoration. Looking at the instrument panel, a wrapped mid-bolster running cross car vehicle through the center of the IP. That is the area that is most expected to be wrapped now, just because that is more of a high touch area to the customer. The top pad, even though this does feel like a soft touch material, it's not like that mid panel. This is traditionally going to more of a hard plastic now just because you're not always putting your hands up on top of the IP, but you normally touch a lot of the stuff that's forward facing to you. Looking at the wrapped portions of this door, we have a sewn wrapped top here. We have a soft touch wrapped panel here, here, another sewn, and another sewn. Now you'll notice this is not the same material between these two. This seems to be more like a traditional sheet stock material where this appears to be, I would say what's called an in-mold grain. So in-mold grain means that there is some sort of a tool that makes this shape and applies this grain. In mold grain lamination means that it made this shape, applied this grain at the same time that it was gluing it to a plastic substrate. This was not in mold grain lamination just because this is a real stitched seam. You would have had to have molded the materials, then gone through and sewn them, and then gone through a lamination process. Now, Knowing that, since I look at these things from cost, if I do an in-mold grain lamination, that is one tool. That is one tool within one machine that I have blank raw material being applied, vacuumed down, applying a grain, 
bonding and going out. But if I have an in-mold grain with this type of allied stitch, that means that I had one tool that created the form, created the grain, then it had to go through a sewing process, then it had to go into another tool that is providing that lamination. So I've doubled the amount of tooling that is required to make that type of a part. Now, one thing that is curious to me, you can do this all in one piece and this seam line in the middle would be fake. That would not be an actual join seam, but this would be a real live stitch on top. I cannot tell right now, unless I got out a really good magnifying glass, if this is a real live seam. If this is an in mold grain seam, they did a very good job because it's normally hard to get it looking directly or exactly like a sewn stitch. What we've done in the past is we'll actually make a three dimensional model of the part. We will wrap it with a real skin. Sometimes we'll even sew that skin. Then they will grow a nickel tool off of that skin. Then they'll go into the tool, which has a little tiny line where the skin pieces came together and they'll actually nick it to make it look like stitching. I can't tell if that's what's happened here. I don't think it is. I think they just had a really tight stitch per inch to join that. But when we take this apart, we can find out if that is here, here, and here. Going on to the center console, a lot of stylized buttons. You can debate whether or not a vehicle has too many buttons, if it's better to get rid of them. Some people like certain buttons more than others. But if I'm talking about styling, and I'm talking about where money was put into something. We have the painted buttons, we have a high gloss, we have what's most likely a etched uh, reveal for a light up button. We have chrome, uh, multicolored paint. A lot of money would have been put into these components for this center console for the decoration. If this is the $30,000 vehicle, I would say, oh, wow, they gave away a lot. If this was a $60,000 vehicle, that would be more expected. Center console has a center console armrest, which you would expect. That is interesting. There's no lock. It has a lot of tension in the hinge, so it's not just going to fly up if I were to rear end someone, hit the brakes but no actual latch. So putting more money into some sort of a um, tension spring in the hinge, maybe that is a good cost save opportunity. Get rid of a physical latch. Gonna have to remember that. All right, so this appears to be a grab handle. Now we are tearing this vehicle apart so I'm not too worried about if I were to actually break this handle, but there's a lot of movement in this handle, especially for someone of my size. And I know I'm a big guy, so I might be the type of person that would break this. Question becomes, what is this handle for? If it's to get into the vehicle, that's a long way to reach. And it's a long, it's an odd direction to pull. Normally I would want to pull myself up I'm not pulling myself in when I have to cover two and a half, three feet to the ground. So if I'm in the vehicle, which I'm going to have to adjust this seat. <laughs> so if I'm in the vehicle and I'm driving and I'm a crazy driver, someone is my passenger. And I might take turns faster and quicker than someone might expect. Is this something just to give yourself stability while you're on the road with a crazy driver like me? I don't know. I'm thinking about the cost. In order to have this to be a wrapped component, you have to close off the edge of the wrapping, which you can see in here, there is another panel that has to close out that edge. There's also probably some sort of a structure in here. So we have a structure, we have a plastic cover, plastic closeout panel, times two. Is that a worthwhile position to put this type of a feature compared to, oh, look at that. We have a pocket for a handle 
There is no handle on the driver's side. There is on the passenger side. There's one here too. But not on the driver. So it seems funny that they built a tool that accounts for this. Maybe this is right hand drive, left hand drive. They left the depression there in case this was a right hand drive vehicle, then they'd have to pop out for that attachment. So with this sun visor, I have a mirror. Now here's a question. Um, there's a debate. Do you put a mirror on both sides or only on the passenger side? Is there a reason why the driver should be primping and looking at themselves while they may be on the road or not? Notice the little close off door. Turns on the light. All right, so now we have to figure out what is our logic? What is causing this to happen? And let's say I left the window open and I closed it. Is it gonna shut off? Yes, it does. So I have to have some sort of a feedback in there. What is causing that switch to turn it off at that position? That is something that's adding into the cost. If I'm talking about my comfort in the vehicle, when I used to work for a seating company, we would have different people within the company of different body sizes sit in every position of the seat. And basically you'd have to close your eyes and you'd have to describe how everything felt in every position of your body. You'd close your eyes just so that you focused your senses on the way you felt. Where does the foam split away from my back? Where are the pressure points in the cushion? Now, this does feel like it's fairly firm foam. And it also feels like the seat is a little narrow for my body size. But it's very comfortable. It, it feels like it fits my body. I don't have anywhere where I have a noticeable bolster or protrusion that is causing me any discomfort or any annoyance. Um, which that actually feels like it would be something that's quite decent on a long drive. I would have to find out how to adjust the steering wheel. It's a little low for me. Um, I might also want to see if I can pull it back a little bit away from the instrument panel. But the way it feels is actually quite nice. So as we set across this instrument panel, it's fairly flat, fairly linear, which is more of a current style. Our mid bolster runs side to side per vehicle. Our top pad is one piece. They're not splitting it. Even though there is a bump in the center monument, there's no actual breakup, so it's not a separate component. Sometimes they'll do a breakup if they had multiple versions of a center screen. That way they could switch out one for the other. Or again, let's say that this was a right-hand drive, left-hand drive version. There's a possibility that they could keep the main structure and then just have a pop-out section but this is all one piece. This section here is for a heads up display. Now that just reflects off the windshield showing you your speed or whatever types of data you wanna apply up there. You'll notice it's actually quite large. Um, I've seen those kind of range of trying to get them smaller just so you're not taking up as large of a space. One thing that I think is kind of interesting though, this looks like it drops down from the top so it sits completely on the A surface. That's another thing that you can do if you have this as an option. I've seen them make a base version and then you actually make a punch tool that punches out within the base version. But if you're using a punch tool, that means you have a raw cut edge. So the top pad cannot be the uppermost surface. So then this is a drop in on top. Now it may have just been designed as a drop in from the beginning and there is no punch tool, but it's an option you can have if you wanna save some tooling costs and not have multiple versions of the instrument panel. Going across, we also have this cutout in front of the passenger. That's basically a, another passenger storage area. Now there is still a glove box in this vehicle. So we do have glove box storage. Then we have an upper storage. Now we saw that on the F-150 as well. The F-150, however, did have a door for the upper section. Um, so there were two glove box openings. There are some other versions that don't have that door that just leave it as an opening. I always question, however, what happens when I hit the brakes or what happens if I have to hit the gas? What am I actually putting in there? Nice thing is it does have a very deep recess. So if it was small things rolling around, they should be perfectly fine. Um, but you probably wouldn't want to put a book or your iPad in that area. 
So a lot of the same styling from the front seat carries over into the rear seat. Um, all of the same types of stitching, same type of perforation. Lots of times you put this perforation in ventilated seats and not often are second row seats ventilated, but it looks like they've just carried over the style from the front to the rear. We do have access to the center console. Our AC controls are 110 outlet. So that was one thing that I was kind of curious about. I don't exactly know which market this vehicle was built for, whether that would be a uh, North American 110 or not, but it is. USB, USB-C, a little bit of storage area. Storage pocket on both passenger and driver side seat. Some vehicles have actually switched over to only putting a pocket on the passenger seat. Reason being, there's always a driver in the vehicle, and if you actually did have a paper map, you could reach over and stick it in behind the passenger seat, but you can't get access to it from your own seat. But this is putting it on both. Looking at the seat back, adjustable headrests, pull down armrest, cup holder, does have little detents for the cup holder. Here's something that's interesting. Look at these detents. Some vehicles, these are actual injection molded pieces of plastic that are spring loaded that grab your cup. These are just molded, it's a one piece molded rubber and they flex in and out of the way. So you're able to save some of the part count, but you're using a injection molding material that kind of uh, a Santa Preen type rubber, which is a little more expensive. So it's the component cost and the labor of putting it together compared to a higher cost resin, but it's a single part. Since we have child anchors and child tether, we need access to that child tether. So the back seat does fold down. Little pull strap here. Now, <clears throat> The question becomes, is this a normal customer use area? Lots of times you would want to use a less expensive type of material on a seat back or on a back wall if it's not an area that the customer is always going to be using or using often. But we've kept a fairly nice carpet on the seat back and also on the back panel. A little warning label here, don't put your suitcase behind here. So I'm assuming there's just not much room so they don't want you to use this for storage. Even though you're not using it for storage, we do have a tool kit that is being stored here. But one other little thing that was kind of funny, we saw this bump in the carpet back panel. And we're like, okay, what component is it? It's actually a little storage pocket for an emergency kit. So they just kind of included that into the sewn carpet panel, rather having another bracket or some other um, component that actually secures it and holds it in place. So I kind of like that easy use of the materials that are already here. So a final opinion for me will really be determined on what actually is the selling price of this vehicle. If this is a $30,000 vehicle for the North American market, that's actually really impressive and it's giving you quite a bit in comfort and also interior styling for that price point. If this is a $60,000 vehicle, then what it is offering is actually expected and it may actually be a, a little low. Knowing that I could have an F-150 Lightning for roughly the same price around that 60,000, if it falls there, then it's not really a game changer. But if it is 30 with this trim package, that's actually quite impressive. So thank you for watching here at Monroe Live. Have a good day.